Is it Disc World Real Long Day? Crap. Look, I've got a lot of chores to do, so you're gonna have to just do them with me. Let's get on with it. Let's. I meant I meant to say let's let's get on with it. Let's get on with it. Oh, were you uh, were you checking out the the photos? This is uh, this is me and all of my friends when we went to Los Angeles. Um, they are all dead now. Uh, even this one, that's me. I jumped off that pier and I never came back. So, and this is the photo that came with the frame. But this is what we're talking about today. Weird Sisters, the sixth book in our Discworld read along. But we're also going to do some chores. I broke it while I was cleaning it. I was just scrubbing the inside of it and then I ripped the handle off. I'm not strong. Tea is definitely the perfect beverage with which to talk about Weird Sisters, uh, specifically the Weird Sisters of the witch variety. So we kick things off with the three witches. We have Nanny Og, Margaret Garlic, and Granny Weatherwax. Now we are going to see these three witches a few times in the Discworld, but this is our first introduction to them as a coven. Coven. Pretty sure it's coven, like oven. Granny Weatherwax and Nanny Og are like peanut butter and mayonnaise. They don't really go together, but they make things really interesting when you put them together. And so having both of them in the same page is absolutely fantastic and is where Granny Weatherwax really starts to show her true characters. I'm gonna get into this a little bit more when I talk about what you thought about this novel, but some people did note that Granny Weatherwax still isn't quite herself, but she is definitely getting there and starting to feel a lot more like Esme Weatherwax as opposed to feeling like just kind of a Dumbledore or Hagrid sort of guide to a young witch growing up. So Nanny Og and Granny Weatherwax and Magrit are our main characters and they carry the story really well every single time that they are all on the page together. Holy He's staring right at me. While Nanny Og, Granny Weatherwax, and Magrit Garlic are all fantastic characters and are our titular characters, this book is filled with a robust cast and all of them really pop off of the page. I especially enjoyed The Fool quite a bit more than I remember enjoying him the first time that I read this book, and The Duke is a really interesting study in the consequence of doing something that goes against nature. He kills the king and then we slowly watch his descent into madness. So this book has an excellent cast of characters and all of them are a lot of fun to read. At least that's what I found. It's a, it's a vacation service. I could do with a vacation. I did see some people who said that they didn't really enjoy all of them. They particularly didn't enjoy Tom John's parts. I did really enjoy the parts with Tom John, but I do understand that you kind of have to have particular tastes in order to enjoy those parts, and they definitely aren't quite as good as the witch segments that we get. I always look forward to the next time that I was going to get to one of the witch sections, but I was also having a good time reading the other parts of the book. Now this story is a bit of a parody of the more traditional plays, particularly the plays that follow the storyline of the one true king. We see a lot of storylines like this. Macbeth is a really good example. This book takes a lot of the themes from those stories and kind of mocks them, but also is in and of itself a story that is just like that and tells it really well. Come on. This is where I sleep. Uh, I also eat in here. Yeah, I got uh, I got kicked out of the house after my resurrection video. I guess my girlfriend didn't really like it. Let's get some, some light in here. That's not the light. How many times do I have to pull it before it stops? That's what she said. There's the light. Cinematography. Um, so we're talking about Weird Sisters today. Uh, which is the sixth book in the Discworld series, and we are currently doing a... Oh, I ripped it. We are currently doing a chronological read-along of Discworld. So if you are not already participating, we are still pretty early in the series, and there's plenty of time for you to go ahead and jump in. This is a series where I, a longtime fan of Discworld, am reading it chronologically for the very first time. And if you didn't already know, I have not read Shepherd's Crown. I am one of those Discworld fans who has deliberately 
avoided reading Terry Pratchett's last book, but as part of this chronological read along, I am going to finally read that book for the first time. But all these other ones, I've read at least once, some of them five, six, ten times. So I'm really enjoying the chronological read through because I've never done it before. And if this is your first time reading chronologically, or even your first time reading Discworld, or if you're just a fan who wanted to participate, I'm really glad to have you along for the ride. It's probably very echoey in here. Uh, that's another problem with my bedroom. So for a quick summary, the king is slain by the duke, who then takes on the throne, but the duke doesn't really care to rule. He doesn't care about much or even all of the kingdom necessarily. He just wants to rule and he's kind of being puppeteered by his wife, the duchess. Over time, we start to see him descend into madness. He even starts spouting basically a confession to what he has done over and over again throughout the book, and he just doesn't get thrown in jail. Seriously, y'all. He starts spouting what is essentially a confession throughout the book, and it just gets more and more ridiculous over time as we watch him descend into madness as a result of the guilt of what he has done. Although that's just my speculation. If you think maybe he was mad when he started and it's just getting worse and is more exacerbated, uh, that is another take that you could have. But for me, I think that it is him not being able to live with what he has done and struggling with it because it doesn't seem like he really wanted to. It seems more like he was pushed into doing what he did. But he killed the king and now he has taken over the throne. But he is not the only person who has a valid claim to the throne, and in fact, he does not even have the most valid claim to the throne. The true heir to the throne is the king's son. But the king's son has a little problem. He's a baby. And babies usually don't make good kings. Maybe there's a couple who are decent, but I guess they have the crying and whining and screaming and tantrum throwing down, which is what most rulers tend to be, but overall, I just don't think that babies should really be kings. So the king's son is a baby and therefore isn't really qualified to, uh, to be king. And on top of that, the baby is missing. Why is the baby missing? Well, the baby was stolen away. And the people who happen upon that baby are our titular characters, Ninyog, Margaret, and Gurney Weatherwax. Now, the three of them are not able to get involved in politics as magic users. And so instead of taking matters into their own hands, they just hand the baby off to a group of thespians and have the players take care of them. But the Usurper King turns out to be a real piece of work and eventually even gets involved with the witches and kind of forces their hand. He tries to tax them, which is a big no-no, even though his attempts to tax them fail, he starts getting really frustrated with the fact that he can't control the witches and so he employs his fool, who later falls in love with Magritte to help him out. And the fool suggests trying to fight the witches with wit and wisdom, trying to use words to compel them to do his bidding. And the best way to do that is, of course, to create a play. This leads to all sorts of fun shenanigans, like the witches being captured and fighting amongst themselves and trying to rescue each other in the castle and all sorts of really entertaining stuff. But we learn over the course of it that the previous king wasn't a great person, but he at least knew how to torture the witches properly. He was, you know, a proper king, the way that kings are supposed to be. And everybody kind of wants that back, even if he was a bit tyrannical and mad and did some awful thing. Now, the way they get involved and the way they resolve this is absolutely fantastic. Probably one of my favorite scenes that we have read so far in this chronological Discworld read-along. It gets resolved during the play that the king hired the playwrights to create, and those playwrights happen to be the same people who employ Tom John, the traveling thespian, and the son of the original king. Now, the play, like I said, is one of my favorite scenes a lot happens in this play. We have the people who are playing the witches in the play getting arrested because the guards think that they are the actual witches, where the actual witches go in and take their place and don't do a very good job of it and are actually cleaning the cauldron and commenting on how dirty and filthy and disgusting the cauldron is and all of this. It's an absolutely hysterical scene and it gets even funnier when death gets involved because he arrives and then he gets stage fright because he's not used to so many people being able to see them, but because they are expecting to see death, they can see death. And so now he has all of these eyes on him and he gets stage fright and he starts stumbling his words. He has to get help to remember his lines. It's absolutely hysterical. I loved the whole scene and it's kind of how the story wraps up. The story eventually wraps up with us finding out that Tom John kind of wants to keep being an actor and doesn't want to become king. And so he doesn't become king, but who does? None other than the fool himself. It turns out that the fool is an illegitimate sibling of the prince, and so he takes the throne. He and Magritte go on to potentially live happily ever after, but I'm sure we're gonna see them again and find out what happens. And that is my summary of Weird Sisters. But let's talk about what I think about it and then talk about what you think about it. You can get up. There you go. Good girl. 
a lot of turtles could have died if it weren't for me. And uh, the people who break into my bedroom really like ring pops. Good as new, other than this. It's, uh, it's been a while since we last spoke, so one of the big upgrades I've done to my bedroom is I installed an electrical panel that doesn't want to electrocute me. So this bedroom is really coming along now. Um, as you can see, I've got working electrical in here, although I wouldn't trust, uh, I wouldn't trust that outlet. <sighs> Looks like uh, a padlock. This is not my padlock, and I think this is the the padlock in question. There's a couple of hobos f***ing in there. Okay. That was my bedroom. Coming outside? Coming outside, Evan? Probably use soap. You can probably tell by how quickly I did the summary that I have a lot of thoughts about this book that I really want to get into. So let's dive in really quickly. I, first of all, really enjoyed this a lot more than I did the last time. And I think that I can attribute that to the fact that when I originally read the book, I wasn't really all that much of a fan of the Shakespeare genre or any of these traditional plays and stories. It was a long time ago. This is one that I'm pretty sure I've only read once before, which most Discworld books I've read more than once. This is just one of those that didn't really stick with me the first time, and so I didn't feel the need to reread it. But I loved it this time around, and I think it's just because it's been about a decade since I read it, and so I have more experience with stories, and I can appreciate what Terry Pratchett was doing with this book a lot more than I did the last time that I read it. So I had a really good time with it. I enjoyed all of the references, and there are a lot of references, and I just enjoyed the parody itself uh, quite a bit more than I did the first time that I read it. And that kind of leads me to realizing that I think this is a book that's going to be a little divisive because if you're not somebody who enjoys that genre or somebody who's ever really experienced that genre in full, or if you're somebody like me who was forced to read things like that, like those classical stories, and you just developed a sour taste in your mouth for them, you're probably not going to enjoy this one. Whereas if you are somebody who enjoys and respects and appreciates those, you're gonna have a really good time with this book. So it just kind of depends on the kind of reader you are, and I totally understand why some people might not like this one, whereas others absolutely adore it. It's definitely not the best of the witches books by far, but it is really entertaining and I did enjoy it quite a bit more than I enjoyed Equal Rights. As much as I enjoyed Granny Og and Nanny Weather... No. As much as I enjoyed Nanny Og and Granny Weatherwax on the page, I think that my favorite moments had to do with The Fool. I really enjoyed the fact that The Fool was somebody who had attended a Guild of Fools and he was supposed to be making Guild approved jokes and he couldn't make any jokes of his own and he was living by this very rigid lifestyle. I enjoyed the dark and tragic backstory that we got for The Fool that was also hilarious in a really twisted and kind of perverted way. The shining example of that and the part that probably made me laugh out loud the most was when he was talking about how he was beaten with a belt and it was made worse by the fact that the belt of course had bells on it because it belonged to a fool. And that continues on throughout the story. We see all these contrasts of the thief really went through some dark stuff and it's always really funny and it's kind of the funniest thing the fool really does because he's making all of these boring guild approved jokes all the time whereas his backstory which is really dark and depressing is absolutely hysterical and i really enjoyed that contrast i also enjoyed the implication that you can't teach comedy and comedy isn't a set of rules and in fact it's something that's supposed to violate and twist and pervert those rules to make things amusing because the funniest comedy at least to me and most likely, if you're a Terry Pratchett fan, to you as well, is when the real world gets twisted and turned on its head and dark and horrible things are made to be amusing, right? There are reasons why comedy clubs fill up during times of war and during just dark periods in general, like the Great Depression. People want to laugh and 
a lot of the jokes that are gonna do well there are gonna be jokes that make light of the current horrible situation that somebody is in. That's my kind of humor, and it's not always well received by everybody, but I think that it's humor at its best, and this is a really good example of that. Anyway, that continues on throughout the story, and another one of my favorite laugh out loud moments occurs toward the end during the play when Death pulls out the fool's hourglass, and it also has bells on it because of course it does. Absolutely wonderful. I loved The Fool. I loved everything that Terry Pratchett did with The Fool. And I also just love the commentary on humor in general that occurred in this book. Excellent writing there. And I'm sure as well that there are all sorts of other nuances regarding The Fool that I didn't pick up on this time around, but that I will pick up on again when I read it in the future, because I'll have a deeper understanding of storytelling and of the sort of in-depth things that Terry Pratchett is doing. Every single time that I reread a Discworld book, I pull something new out of it. And I'm sure that the next time I read this, I'll find some Thing else to dig out of the fool story. But the fool, absolutely one of my favorite elements of Weird Sisters. Another thing that I want to comment on is the absolutely wonderful romance that we get in Weird Sisters. Truly shockingly well-written romance here in Weird Sisters between Margaret and the fool. I did not expect this and I didn't remember it being here. Again, I was a lot younger when I read this book the first time. And so the romance probably didn't really stand out to me as being really well written, but especially when we contrast it with the semi-forced romance in Mort that I didn't really pick up on, although I will admit it was kind of cute, but this romance is way more well-written and it's probably, I'm gonna have to say one of my favorite fantasy romances that I've read, especially condensed into a short novel when it only gets a couple of scenes. It is surprising how believable the romance in this is. And it's because Terry Pratchett plays up on how awkward and uncomfortable the early stages of falling in love really are. He keeps commenting on these things like the fact that most of the first time that you start falling in love with somebody, you're gonna be just staring at your feet, mumbling and not really talking about much of anything. He comments on the awkwardness of the first kiss and how it feels like it drags on a lot longer than it does, and maybe it's not as magical as you think that it is. All sorts of other things like that go on throughout the book that makes this romance feel raw and believable, and you really want these two crazy kids to get together and be together and be happy. A lot more so for me than I did with Mort and Death's daughter because this time it really feels a lot more believable and I've been there. I've had those emotions. I've had those awkward moments and the fact that Terry Pratchett chose those to fixate on as opposed to trying to go for the gooey, ooey, mushy romance garbage. Ultimately, it just made this a more raw, real, and believable fantasy romance than most of the fantasy romances that we tend to get today. I'm not trying to dog on anything in particular, but the ones that just feel too good to be true, they don't really sit well with me. Whereas this one, because it was played up for laughs, it felt a lot more like a real romance to me. I will say probably one of my favorite rom-coms is they came together because it's awkward and weird and it's meant to be silly and stupid and that kind of makes it a little more believable to me than most rom-coms that people force me to watch while my eyes are taped open. Now, while I've made it clear that I really did enjoy this book a lot, I do need to comment on a couple of things that I didn't particularly love about this book. There are a couple of things in Weird Sisters that just didn't really sit well with me this time around. It's only a couple of moments and they're usually just throwaway lines, but there were a couple of things in here where I, it didn't really empower our characters, it didn't really progress the story, it didn't do much of anything except fall into some fantasy tropes that I really don't like and that we've all kind of discarded and set aside in our modern day. This doesn't mean that the book doesn't hold up by any means. I've found that Discworld is holding up remarkably well, um, but there were just a couple of things in here that kind of dated the book as, as letting you know that, yeah, this book was written, you know, 40 or 50 years ago. Uh, 40, right? This book was written in 1988, and there are a couple of moments in here that really show uh, the book's age. Not a lot, but there are a couple in there that do stand out a little bit, and you probably know what I'm talking about. Nothing that was horrible or that I would say, yeah, don't read this book, or that I would dog on, and nothing that I think had any malintent or anything malicious behind it. More or less, it's just a sign of the times when it was written, and some things don't age as well as others, and that's just something you gotta deal with. Still really good, but there were some moments in there, more so than the previous Discworld books that I'd read, that were kind of towing that line. Uh, and then the next thing that I wanna mention is that the ending kind of drags on for a little bit. It's interesting because Equal Rights kind of had the opposite problem where the ending just happened suddenly and I was perturbed by that. This time, I feel like the story really should have ended with the play. I think that the whole story should have been wrapped up during the play and then maybe ended with the curtains closing or a stage bow or stage freeze. Stage freeze. Don't say stage freeze, just do it. But instead the play ends and then the story kind of keeps going for a little too long. It seemed like it took a while for it to wrap up. Now it did wrap up nicely. I just feel like it could have wrapped up a little bit sooner and maybe we could have nixed the last couple of chapters. 
Far be it from me to complain about getting more Discworld, but that's just my opinion on the story itself. I feel like if it had ended with the play, that would have just been a really excellent way to conclude a story that is a parody of plays in and of themselves. That's just my opinion. But now we are going to get to the best part of the discussion videos, and that is your thoughts. But I'm gonna go ahead and head into the library in order to talk about that. Alrighty. Your thoughts on Weird Sisters. If you don't know, as part of this read along, I always put up a poll on my community tab one week before the discussion video goes live. That poll is for you to give a star rating and then for you to leave any comments you might have about the Discworld book that we just read together. And then as part of the process of writing and filming the video, I go through all of those remarks and ratings and I analyze those and I put those in the discussion video itself. So if you want your thoughts to be included for the next one, make sure that you have the book read at least a week before the deadline date, which I'm going to give you toward the end of this video for the next book. All right, let's go ahead and get into your thoughts, beginning with the star rating. I think this is the poll that I got the most votes on so far, which is fantastic. I know that less than 20 people voting in a poll like this doesn't seem like a big number, especially when you look at some of the larger booktubers, but I have a really small channel and I was never really expecting more than a handful of people to participate in the read-alongs. So even getting north of 10 people to participate in one of the polls is really awesome for me. And I really enjoy engaging with other enjoyers of Discord world on this channel and just in general. So I really appreciate everybody who has participated in these polls and I look forward to seeing those numbers potentially rise. So that's a story for another time. All right, so first I'm gonna go ahead and throw these star ratings up on the screen because it's a pretty interesting split. We have a very strong leaning toward the five star mark, although there are quite a few four stars and even a couple of two star votes, which is pretty interesting to me. I feel like more than likely those two star voters are going to be people who just don't really enjoy the Shakespearean elements of the work. And I totally understand that. Like I said, I didn't enjoy that and didn't really like this book the first time that I read it. And I think it's just going to be a book that evolves for you in terms of taste and appreciation over time, depending on your experiences and also just how you're feeling when you read it. If I weren't in the mood for a sort of Shakespearean parody, I probably would not have enjoyed reading through this book. It's very niche, I find, probably a little more niche than some of the other Discworld books we've read so far. So your opinion of it is most likely going to fluctuate. And that might be true for a number of the other Discworld books that we're going to read later on, which I'm really excited to see how I feel about them now that I have grown and gained more experience as a reader since the last time that I read some of them. Now, if that is or isn't the reason why you voted two stars, if you are one of the people who gave the book two stars, I'd love to hear why that was. Why is it that you gave this one two stars? What worked for you? What didn't? What did you expect to see that you didn't get? And that also just goes for anybody who votes in the polls. I'd love to hear the explanation for the rating that you give to any of the Discworld books that we are reading. So, so if you wanna take the time to drop a comment, I would really enjoy looking into and getting some insight into why you gave this book the rating you did, whether you gave it five Five stars or two. For myself, I really would give it somewhere in the middle there of about 4.5 stars, but I don't really do half stars on the channel. And I'm leaning more toward five stars because of Grebo, Niniog's cat. Grebo is a fantastic character and getting to have his point of view like getting to read from his perspective in the book for a couple of scenes was a lot of fun. So Honestly, that is gonna be what kind of tips it from 4.5 to five stars for me. So I'm giving this one five stars, but any other day of the week, I might go ahead and give it four stars. It's just gonna depend. I know that I'm rating a lot of the Discworld books very highly, and maybe I need to consider rating them as Discworld books as opposed to rating them in the grand scheme of literature. But right now I'm just giving them star ratings based on how I feel about them as books compared to all other books that I have read. And this was definitely a book that I enjoyed a great deal, and so, Five stars makes sense to me. But now we're gonna get into the comments and I have a couple of comments that I wanna read to you and give my own thoughts on. We're gonna start with this one from Spencer Cregan. I hope that I'm pronouncing that correctly. It's far from my favorite witch's book, but dang, it's a great intro to the characters and the disc world. I often recommend it to people curious about diving in. Granny is still a book and a half away from being Granny, but all the bits and bods are there. It's great to see her evolve from the grump she is in this book to the powerhouse role model of a woman she becomes over the next book starting with Witches Abroad. Really great review and just a really solid summary of what makes this book really good and also what causes you to look forward to the next books in the Witches series. I'm really excited as well to see Granny grow into herself. I've mentioned a couple of times before that my very first book in Discworld at all was a Tiffany Aching book that I read when I was about 12 or 13, I think. I'd have to go back and do the math on that, but I'm pretty sure I was about 12 or 13 when I read it. 
and <coughs> wow. <coughs> And Gurney Weatherwax appears in a couple of those Tiffany Aching books. Maybe she's just mentioned a couple of times, but she is in those books. And so I myself have a pretty special attachment to her as well, because she's one of those first recurring Discworld characters that I encountered. And I really enjoy her as a character and getting to see her much later in life and then having to go back now reading her chronologically and seeing how she develops has been really interesting. So I am also really excited to see Granny become who I know she really is and who she really can be. Now, the next point that I wanna dive into is something that was briefly mentioned in the previous video from a comment. And that is that Weird Sisters is a good starting point for Discworld. I had never considered this myself, but I'd also never really read Discworld in chronological order. In the previous video, it was mentioned that the book Sorcery, which we read last time, is a pretty good capstone to early Discworld and that we go on to bigger and better things that feel more like the real Discworld that we come to know and love with the next book. And I'd never thought of Weird Sisters in that light. This time reading it through, I absolutely see what that means. Yes, it is still very much a parody and kind of a riffing off of other works, and yet we are also seeing Discworld starting to come into its own. And that makes this an excellent introduction into the series and into the world as a whole. So I can totally see how if you're trying to recommend that somebody start reading the books chronologically, they start at Weird Sisters and then after they finish the books or maybe later on in the series, they go back and read some of those earlier Discworld books. Even though I do like a couple of the other books in early Discworld and I think Mort itself stands out like a sore thumb among them as just this brilliant work that is very unique in and of itself. I do agree that Weird Sisters is a pretty good starting point for real Discworld and what Discworld is really going to come to represent. Because after this, we have Pyramids and then we have Guards Guards. And as I look forward to all these next books, there's not a single one that I'm not really excited to read. And I kind of feel like the slog has ended now and it ended before Weird Sisters. Uh, Weird Sisters was a lot of fun and I definitely agree. If I were going to tell somebody now to start reading chronologically, I'd have them start with this book and then dive into those early books later on. This does feel like the point where Discworld really begins. So thank you, Spencer, for your comment. And now I'm going to get to Mark III's comment. Mark III says, My late father-in-law's favorite, but then he was a Shakespeare nut. While clearly a Scottish play riff, it still feels like its own beast in a way earlier books didn't. This is a fantastic summary once again, and I did comment on it just now that this does feel like a beast in and of itself. It is unique and it stands out even if it is still parodying other works. I feel like it's kind of the end of that phase of Discworld and does a really good job of that. It's been a while since I've read Pyramids, but if I recall correctly, it does start to establish a lot more history to the Discworld and starts to expand it a great deal more into being way more than just a fantasy world designed to parody all of the other fantasy worlds and to just make a mockery of those sorts of things and be purely comedic. It starts to make the Discworld its own living, breathing thing that is a lot of fun to read in and a lot of fun for Terry Pratchett to write stories in, like the stories he comes up with in the Discworld are great and I'm glad that we have these foundational books but I'm really excited to get into what Discworld actually is. So this stands out on its own. Pyramids I know stands out really well on its own and I'm also excited to get to Guards Guards after that. So if you're as excited as I am for this next phase of Discworld, I can't wait to be part of it with you. And now that is going to bring us to what's next. As I mentioned, we're going to be reading Pyramids next. So let me go ahead and put this back on the shelf and pull that one down. Here it is. This is probably one of my favorite of the Collector's Edition library book covers too. It's really awesome, gets you excited for the book. And this is one that I think I'm probably gonna be able to knock out in a day. The last couple have taken me about two or three days to be able to read through just because of how busy I am. But I know how quickly I can get through this one because I've read it several times. It's a lot of fun. I really enjoy Pyramids, but it has probably been a few years now since I've reread this book. So I'm eager to get into it and see what I think of the book. And I'm also eager to see what you think about the book. So I'm gonna go ahead and give you the dates that you need to have this book read by. But before I give you the details on that, I did wanna get a couple of the typical YouTube stuff out of the way. I know, I know, it's very boring. I'm gonna be as quick as possible. First of all, I wanna say thank you very much for letting me get to 500 subscribers. I never thought I was going to get to that point. Okay, yeah, there were times when I would talk to myself in the shower and talk about my 500 subscriber thank you speech. I don't actually have one. I just wanna say I'm really grateful to every single one of you and I didn't think that I was going to find that many people who were interested in the same things that I'm interested in, but that is the magic of the internet. So thank you all for being here and deciding that my brand of weird is not too weird for you. Uh, I can promise you that things are only gonna get weirder. So if you wanna subscribe, I, I understand, but I'm just gonna keep being weird and doing whatever the heck I want to within the limits of YouTube's community guidelines, probably. We'll see. I mean, I mean, I am YouTube. I will be in the community guideline limitations. Maybe the joke that I made in the pool house earlier was 
too much. So whether there are 10, 20, 30, 200, or 500 of you participating in the Discworld Read Along, I'm really grateful for every single one of you, and I'm excited to hear your insights into each of the books as we continue to read through them. So thank you very much for being here and for deciding that my brain of weird is not too weird for you. It is It is gonna get weirder though. The more confident I get on this platform, the, the more I reveal just how incredibly bizarre my sense of humor is. So be prepared for that. Anyway, so the YouTube begging or whatever, all the subscriptions, likes, comments, everything like that does really help to boost the videos. And now I'm gonna give you the dates for pyramids. First, the video is gonna come out on June 7th, and that means that you need to have this book read by May 31st. That's math, right? That's correct? May 31st. If you wanna participate in the discussion post, that post is going to go live on May 31st. That means you have a little over a month to read this book, and it's a really quick read, just like I mentioned. It's easy to get through, it's a breeze, it's a lot of fun. I'm really excited to hear what people have to say about this one, so go ahead and pick up a copy of Pyramids and get ready to give me your thoughts on it. The video is gonna come out on June 7th, and then I'm going to be on a bit of a hiatus until the end of June. As I've mentioned a few times, I like to take off one month in the summer and one month in the winter so that I can try to work on some other projects, and I have a lot of projects in the works right now, like a TTRPG core system that I've been writing for a while, and I wanna make sure that I'm grinding that out, and the best way for me to do that is to just take some time off from the pressure of creating videos and that sort of thing. So I will be taking a few weeks off, and that's gonna be a great opportunity for you to catch up to us in the Discord read-along. So if you're somebody who's been watching along with these videos, but you haven't had the time to read along, I'll also be putting out a post just to remind everybody that, hey, if you haven't had the chance to participate, you're gonna have that opportunity here to catch up with all the books that you've missed out on so far. We are not that far in. This is the seventh book, and we have 40-something to go through. So we've got quite a ways, and you can really easily catch up to us and participate in this read-along. And I'd love to have you along for the ride, so this is a really good chance coming up for you to catch up to us. And that's all that I've got other than just saying thank you once again, everybody, for 500 and for being here, for checking out the videos, supporting them however you want. All of that does really help out. I'm doing this because I want to do this, and whether I only had 50 people watching the video or 1,000 people watching the video or 20,000 people watching the video, I still do whatever I enjoy and hope that the people who are the correct audience for it happen to find the video and want to participate in this read-along. So thank you very much for taking the time to check out this video. And if you want to see another video from me, you can do so by clicking up here. And until next time, bye.